Okay. Hello, Donna. Um, let's see. Today is August 7th, August, I keep wanting to say August, October 17th, uh, 2018. It's a six o'clock meeting of ITSC 2347 coming at you live and direct from beautiful downtown Frisco, Collin College. Um, and today I wanted to talk about several things. It's um, a lot of this I have already covered in, um, and recordings, but I think it's best if I went ahead and did it anyway. Um, again, this this one, I have my errata table. My errata table, I have 14 fields. It probably wouldn't hurt to have an error number with that. So like, uh, it would be, what? went wrong so that you could tell what had happened. And so the, uh, there might be 20 different errors that you could throw, give them all numbers, and then just insert that number. Um, this is typically gonna get written from the triggers, is the idea. So I'm not gonna write the errata table from the procedures, because the procedures, stuff just bounces off the procedures, that's the whole idea. All that happens when you hit, when you, provoke an error in the procedure is that uh, you just get an error communicated to the user. Okay, uh, so in the, in the trigger, we're gonna write this. Now I have an EID and an E-date. These guys come from a sequence and the system date. So <clears throat> that's the only, the only thing that, the, the only restriction here is its primary key. And we're gonna let that just happen. Uh, normally, the rest of the stuff <clears throat> can be I, it defaults to null. So the only thing you have to provide this table is an EID and a date, and you get it from a sequence. So you could just call it, just uh, insert, and don't have to insert anything. The rest of it is all nulls. All, all will default to null if you don't provide it. A stored procedure named RPS write errata. Um, job um, so it, it just it just takes the the tedious stuff uh, the writing out of the um, trigger so basically it just sits out there it um, the procedure takes it and just turns around and dumps it all in there it uses the sequence the get date and the rest of them whatever you give me if you don't give me anything, okay. um, it's probably overkill to default my parameters to null and default the table to null. <laughs> I'm making sure they're null, uh, but I, this, this is a table I'm not gonna worry about nulls. I just, uh, so it, probably I don't need to do both of these default it to null in the table and default the parameter to null. But this would probably be plenty. Okay, insert. And there they are, just run them in there. And so now you could just say, so here would be the hypothetical, here's a hypothetical from the games. Something bad happened, RPS writer rata. Um, so game ID gets the game ID from the table, G date, the error, the date of the error, and so on. Just the, the, the fields I want to put in there. So if I don't, if I don't mention them, it's left null. If I, don't put, I don't have to put them in any order or anything. And logically, I would expect it to write passing by name. And I notice that in our forms, we do a lot of passing by name. Uh, in fact, in the, at the form level, we don't pass by uh, position. And I like to be able to do both. When I have that many parameters, it gets a bit tedious to try to remember the position. Um, but it won't. And this is true in all of these things. Whenever a trigger throws an error, everything that happens in the trigger 
turns into a pumpkin. Um, okay. So it's all rolled back. And you can try it anyway. You can try committing. Uh, Oracle is not going to let you commit in a trigger. It says, no, you can't do that. Um, in SQL Server, you can, but it doesn't make any difference because it still rolls it back anyway. Um, okay, so our solution. And the solution is commonly called, if, you were, if you're Googling it, you're going to Google the idea of the autonomous transaction. And so if you said SQL Server autonomous transaction, you'd get some hits. And it would talk about, well, there isn't one, but it's called something else in SQL Server. In Oracle, it's called an autonomous transaction. Um, so I say it's proprietary to Oracle. Syntax is different across the various platforms, but there's something like this that does basically you're cutting it loose and you're spawning a child process that is going to execute on its own. And that's what we mean by autonomous transaction. It executes independently of the uh, whatever happens to the, to the trigger that's executing. So it takes off, it does its own thing. Now the trigger throws an error, rolls everything back, but that continues on to completion. And, um, and you've always got something like that because if you throw an error, throwing an error rolls back. It just does. Uh, okay, first we're going to create the link server. Um, and we log in. I believe we have to log in as the administrator. And, but once we execute this code, we don't have to fool with it again. Everything will be fine. And we just execute this guy one time. This. Um, this creates a second server who his name is loopback. Now that's called a loopback server. A loopback server is a virtual server that is running beside my server on the same server. So we're both on uh, SQL Express. And so it's two servers, one, two virtual servers running on the same one. It's another instance of the server that I've spawned. Um, Loop back the name doesn't mean anything. I could have named it X. Um, most of the time you use this syntax and loop back means that, that that's what it is. Um, that's kind of a lame uh, or a, a colloquial term, a term that somebody made up for it. It's called a loop back server. So I don't have to name it that. I could name it foo. Um, the server product is nothing there. By the way, N means, um, capital N means interpreted as a 16-bit um, character. So you'd be able to put Chinese characters in there. Um, there's nothing in here that requires, if we didn't have that capital N in there, it wouldn't. <clears throat> Nothing would, nothing would happen. International, yeah. It's a uh, um, uh, um, rich text. Uh, SQL, NCI, and then the server, the, the, this is, it's going to run. The data source is the server we're on now. Okay. Um, the, next, the next two are just housekeeping, guys. Doesn't matter really what order you execute them in. By the way, uh, Mary, I told you something that was wrong. I told you, or I told several people, I said, don't use the SP uh, prefix. I said, well, that's a kind of a reserved one. No, it isn't. It means stored procedure. Um, and I was thinking it was reserved for, for one of the uh, administrative functions, but it's not. It's, it's a stored procedure, and so you're free to use it. So it configures it, creates it. So it used to be this, but we're going to have the new one. So here we go. If the error condition begin, uh, so execute loopback, and all, basically the only thing that's happened is we've added the loopback. Once I add the loopback, I think... I think I have to give it the full meal deal. So I say loopback.rpsdb. In other words, I have to specify the database and the DBO. 
and I don't think I can just say loop back dot RPS writer rada. I think I have to get that whole string in there, but that's okay. It's just I just copy it once. Um, writer rada, and then I pass it the parameters that I want to write. Yes. Okay. Uh, I just want to see if I understand this. Is the goal of using a creating and using a loopback server to uh, keep from uh, rolling back uh, something and uh, trigger happens? The question was, is the goal of using the loopback server to avoid the, the rollback when the, when the trigger throws an error? Right. It's not, yes, that's true, the, to avoid rolling back when the error is thrown. Because if you throw an error, you're going to roll back anything that happened in that procedure. So a trigger is just another procedure, really. Um, it executes when something happens when you insert or update or uh, delete. So um, I can't trigger select. But when something changes data, the trigger can execute. It can execute either before it happens, which is uh, here we call it an instead of, and it can execute after it happens. The before it happens are usually used for checking and error logging and stuff like that. <clears throat> after triggers uh, are typically used, well, after triggers can be used for logging also. Um, if I'm going to throw an error in any procedure, I'm going to have to put it, if, if I'm going to throw an error and I want something to be written to a log table, I have to put that, put that right on the, to the log onto a loopback server or make it an autonomous process. And so if you're in Oracle, you're going to find exactly the same thing, exactly the same problem, and your Google is called autonomous process. You use it any time that you want to write something to an error log and subsequently throw an error. If you throw an error, you roll back. I would, this, this happens in the instead of trigger. Uh, I do not write, in, in my world, I do not write to the error table from the procedures. So the procedure insert player, if I get an error in insert player, I just, I just put set error level to three, exit, and let somebody else deal with it. Um, that's when I get to the to the trigger with an error, something went wrong. Okay. So in piece of code, we can put it in the end of trigger. Yes. Mm -hmm. right. Yes. Mm -hmm. This is how. So the only thing is, instead of the RPS write errata, I just pick up this um, prepend. Well, you can you can delete. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean. Let me see if I can find one here. Um, no, originally instead of the trigger, we say if this is known, we will use the complete method. Nothing wrong, and then we insert. And we insert. We use the trigger to the insert table. Well. Uh, you don't you don't need to do that for an insert. Just a normal insert into player's table. You don't need to put it on a loopback server because you're not. You should not be throwing an error. If something does throw an error, that's bad. Because we should have checked everything. So the question is, what's throwing the error? There should not be anything left to throw the error because we should our our procedure should have checked every possibility. So we should know it's going to go, and that's why I say if you if you get an error in the insert, that's a, a far worse error. Right, instead of the trigger, the file without the error has to be 
right right yes and and that's fine and that's the way it's supposed to go but if you hit if you find an error in in the trigger if you find an error you're going to throw you want to log that error you want to log what happened before you throw so that somebody can go back and figure out why you threw that error now we use the loop back for that um i think i have one here In my procedure, is it in my procedure? No, it's in my triggers. Triggers, and I think it's, I think it's in the games trigger where I was testing it. I'm, I just put a right errata there. Okay, here's an example of the loop back. Okay, so by the way, I've changed the, um, instead of using count, select count, uh, it was suggested by one of the guys in the groups that I was, because I was discussing this in uh, some of the uh, users groups, and he says, well, don't use, you know, if, don't, don't select count, and then test is count zero or one, just say if exists, because all it's got to do is find one, and exists is true, whereas count makes it go all the way through. So as soon as it finds one, it can quit. So exists is stronger. Uh, so if the, let's see, what is this, RPS games? So if a game, I'm trying to insert a game, and if a game already exists, we're gonna throw that and I, uh, I should have something in here that tells me what happened. There should be a text field in there that says, uh, uh, char, make it a big varchar field uh, um, discussion, E underscore discussion or something like that. And um, then uh, just varchar and just make it be some verbiage, varchar 250. So you can type all you want into it. And then I would put this into the table. Uh, but I would say, what, what error was it? Uh, not just error one. I would say error uh, pre already exists. Game ID already exists. We shouldn't have gotten there. What, what was supposed to be checking that before we got there? How come we're hitting that trigger? By the way, if you just do a straight insert on the table, you'll hit the trigger. So if you want to test your triggers, just go in as your, your uh, DBO, just do an insert of bad data and you'll hit the triggers. But your public user is not supposed to be able to do that. Your public user can't see the tables. So if we're getting uh, traffic on these triggers, something's wrong. Well, Oh, here I just say right errata. I mean that. Every place I say right errata. So if I only have one of them, is that an erratum? Um, I don't know. Questions on that? I think I've about beat that horse to death. Okay. Now the fun begins. Uh, let's look at Visual Basic. Uh, Visual Basic is part of <clears throat> Visual Studio, and I think I said in the in the last recording, I think I said that I was looking at ASP means Active Server Pages, and it is a framework. And the Visual Studio is a program that implements Active Server Pages. Um, you using Visual Basic, C Sharp, Python. Um, it's a whole suite of programming language, languages and programming environments. Um, and one of these is Visual Basic. Now Visual Basic is kind of the premier language for writing Windows applications. Um, nice thing about it is I can compile it to an install file 
and you can install it on your computer and now you do not have the source code so if I give it to you to install on your computer you can't see the, the passwords easily now I'm not going to be I'm, I'm I know you can get them because if you if you were to go into that file with a, a binary editor you'd find it um, the other thing I do, I would probably do is put it on a web server, and then when you came to that server, all you would get would be that page. So, let's look at it. Right. Yes, those are languages that implement ASP. Okay. Um, the reading that I've been doing on it and I've been studying it is because I'd never really fooled with ASP and they're saying don't learn ASP because a, uh, frameworks come and go very quickly. But Visual Basic is going to be around. C Sharp has probably made the test of time. Um, it took me a long time to warm up to the fact that I'm going to have to learn C sharp. Okay, so I'm going to do it. So ideally, uh, this I can I can just say start uh, debug, start without debugging is fine, and that will um, uh, compile. I don't think it was needed to be compiled. And all I'm going to get this is what the user will have. Uh, just this. Running, so they log into my rock, paper, scissors server, and they get well, they would probably get a, a, a welcome window, and from here they could click buttons and go to insert player, insert game. Instead of insert round, I would probably say play game. And in play game, I would actually play the game and declare the winner because I don't need the database to declare a winner. I can do all that with what I've got right there on the page. Yeah, because I've got everything I need for that locally. So I don't have to go play the game on the database. That's silly. Um, okay, and so this is all they see. So I would have a, um, a, a web browser like uh, Explorer or Chrome or something. Well, there's no reason to write the the winner to the database right i don't i don't save anything that i can calculate typically so there's no reason to store it i mean this this uh um the the uh exercise here is not about rock paper scissors i guess you figured uh, <laughs> so um yeah there's no reason to write it back uh i can play the game uh, if I want to find out if I have one particular round ID, I can get all of the all of the rounds that are associated with game ID 22. I can give me all of those rounds, and then I can just loop through them and calculate the the winner. Mm -hmm. Sure. Right. I've got everything I need to do that. Okay. So uh, if I were to put in the player. Um, Dasher and Donner and Comet and Cupid and this is Ted and the password is what? yeah <laughs> insert player when I go in insert player Dasher was successfully inserted yippee Okay, um, so that's, uh, and if I. So would you get, would you, um, like if you tried to insert the same player again and you got an error, would you get that message output? Yes, uh-huh. Uh, let's see, let's, uh, the, you know, this is uh, the player X password. So I, I, I never check how long it is. It's, if it's something that's good enough for me. Um, so I'll let you put in a player ID of X. When I insert player, it tells you that the ID is null. Um, if the player ID and the player name is null. So, so, um, how, 
how is how are you generating that message? Right I'm going about to show you. This flip right at what I've got returning from my procedure is just the error level. Right. Range. That's all I return either. I, I let this form take care of that stuff. I'll show you right exactly where I shift gears and I say, okay, this is the, this is the logic. Now I'm going to make it, I call that, I call that pretty. Uh, I, I, um, I am one who is more attuned to the logic of code. I think logical code is beautiful code, but I don't really care if it's got whistles and bells and pictures and all that kind of stuff and color. Um, you get black and white from me. That works. That's why I have digital artists when I'm out in industry. And I give it to my digital art department, but I have to give them one that works and they better not break it. Um, they, they, put, they put all kinds of stuff on it. They got cowboys riding across, playing rock, paper, scissors from their horses. Um, that's fine. Um, and if I have a player ID, pa password, oh, I already had the player's name, null. Um, if I do, that, then the password's null. And if I try to uh, insert a player ID that's already there, no, because Dasher is already in you. So I can't really do much else from here. Let's go look at the code. All right. The, I like the way you echoed back the name, too. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, it's fairly simple to do. Um, I get that from the form. Now, the form. Okay, this is the form. This is the form. This thing right here. It has a name. Um, and I believe my form is named my form one, which isn't very, uh, no, I mean, it's a generic name, but whatever. The form has a name, all right? On the form, I have controls. All of these things that are on here are controls. Here's a control. Yes. Something is running. No, um, something is still running. Debug. I think I'm still. Okay, there, there. You go. I don't, I don't know what, what I had going there. Okay, there's a, there is a control. There's a control, there's a control, there's a control, that's a control, the, those are text boxes, there's a do it button, and this is a, an output box. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine controls that I can see. I might have other, okay? I could have invisible things on there, like a password or something that I've hidden from you. Um, but that's what I can see. Now, the important thing, let's just start with one of them, player ID, for example. Um, we want to go over here and look at, bring him up. These are the um, properties of player ID. The most important part of that is the, is the name. <clears throat> um, and I always try to remember where it is name right there under design the first one under design remember where that guy is the name will be important because the name is not player space id that's just a piece of text that's associated with it its name is a variable uh, so this is a variable and one of the one of the drawbacks to sql and tsql and plsql and oracle and whatever there's no way to get input from the user. This is the user input. Okay. So uh, player ID, the name, txt underscore PID. I always begin my text boxes with txt. Now you're going to get so many names floating around. What have I got? I've got names in the database. I've got names in the TSQL program right? I've got parameter names, I've got local variable names, and now I just have a whole nother level of names in the Visual Basic. 
So you have to have some kind of scheme that keeps them straight. Over here, I name them TXT. That's a text box. If it's a button, it begins with BTN. Okay. Um, let's see. It has a... It, um, uh, uh, it is not, I don't believe Visual Basic is case sensitive. Now, my way of dealing with uh, uh, case sensitivity is I always assume they are case sensitive and that I always keep it the same. I always assume that they are not case sensitive because I will never have two variables that differ only in case. Um, so that's my, uh, I'm going to keep it the same. As I go down, uh, what's a, what else is important? Um, some of this other stuff might be important. Uh, for example, um, the size, the location. Um, by the way, you can, your code can change the, these, these um, properties at runtime. So you can make your text box move around. So when you click it, when you click a button or something, it can move, jump around, or they can change space. They can change places. Um, I'm not, I'd rec not that I would recommend that. I'm just saying that all of these things you can work with. Um, you can lock it. You can disable it. Where when you put something in, and and once you leave it, it won't let you go back and change it. Uh, I am going to talk about that. Uh, I've got an example of that in here that's commented it out. Uh, what Mary was talking about was um, while while you haven't put all the stuff, all the required stuff in, disable some controls. And I'm going to show you that. Uh, let's see. So the player ID is the next one. The 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 main field that you have with a text box is text right here. So if I want to give it at some initial text, like maybe required or something like that, uh, I can give it initial text. R E Q. I can cause it to be centered. Uh, and again, I have control over that. So I have control over this text. Not only can I change it at runtime, but the, the user can type into this field. So this is an input box. And th this, this, is, this is where we're going to get input for our code. So what is that? Well, that's the player ID. It's going to go in as a parameter. Player name is the same thing. Um, if I click on the player name, it's um, um, name is txt p name password txt pwd. Okay, a label. A label is like a text box, but it's out only. Right? It, you can't type into a label, but I can put, I can change a label at runtime. So labels are typically used for output. Text boxes are typically used for input, although a text box can also be used for output. Most of the time, output is a label, input is a text box. I cannot use a label for input. Okay, the button. Insert player. Its name is BTN insert player. Um, it has several properties. What probably the um, most important property that I think it has is, see the text on it. That's the text that you put on the button. You can also change that. So I can use the text that's on a button for output, but usually don't, that'll confuse your user. 
you know, you expect things to work a certain way. Has anybody encountered one of those cars where the key is, you just toss it up on the dashboard and it turn, uh, and the car's enabled? No? Keyless, uh, yeah, a, a wireless key. So you got a fob, you got one? A key, is that wireless? Proximity of the car. Yeah, it's just uh, so that's that's the key. It's got no no key that you put into it, and that bothers that I don't know. It bothers me. <laughs> I don't expect it bothered me the first time I saw one. Let's put it. Okay. Oh, I'm sure you can. Um, cheap cars like I buy. <laughs> well, okay. Oh. Uh, Anyway, I, I, I'm, I'm expecting things to work a certain way. And when they don't work that way, uh, I get kind of confused. We get used to it after a while. It took me a, quite a while to get used to the uh, flashing yellow light means flashing left, left turn signals has changed. There's, a, there's a, a new standard that's come out in the past three or four years about how they flash when meaning yield. They don't put a sign under it says left turn yield anymore. If the light's flashing, that means yield. I think I, I personally like that one. Um, but what I'm saying is if your buttons are jumping around, that's going to confuse people. And so use your labels for output. Keep your life as simple as we can, but I can do lots of weird stuff here. Um, let's see, uh, the one, this one right here, enabled, that one will become important. Enabled. Can you press that button? All right. What about this button? This button is where everything happens. I'm going to double click the button and let's go to the code. I don't need this. Open anymore. By the way, if I need to get to my toolbar over here, um, I would go, I would go to view, uh, toolbox down here somewhere. Here it is toolbox. And well, I don't have any tool, anything to read any reason to use the toolbox right now. Let me get the largest thing I can get here. Maybe my, can we see that well enough? Okay, the first thing that you have to have for this is you must have this line right here. The comments, the comments are different. One of the things I really like about Oracle is that the syntax of the language in which you write your form is the same as PLSQL. That makes a big difference because we have to go over and learn a new language. But it's okay because languages are all pretty much the same. This one uses a quote. Oh, what drives me buggy with this one is double. This one uses double quote. SQL is single quote. That drives me nuts. If you put, if you end with a semicolon in this language, it's an error. Oh boy. Oh well, I just get over that. So this one, the quote, the uh, comment in this one is the single quote. Uh, so imports, system data, SQL client, everything that we're going to do practically uses that uh, library. Um, and we have one public class. Now here is where the fun begins. What happens to a button? It gets clicked. That's an event. Some people call these triggers. And they're in many languages, they are called triggers. I don't think Visual Basic calls them triggers. I think they're events in Visual Basic. But if you go to Oracle, they'll be called triggers in the form. And it doesn't have anything to do with a database trigger. Two different uses of the word trigger. Um, we're not too interested. I don't know how these uh, parameters are handled. Um, I haven't gotten that deeply into it yet. And but it handles what happens when this button gets clicked. So there's the event button insert player click. Now, what else could I have done? Uh, what else can happen to a button besides just getting clicked? It could get double clicked, it could get left clicked, right clicked. You could just bring the mouse over it and stop, right? 
So there's lots of things that can happen that you can trigger. Well, most of the time with a button, you trigger the click or the double click possibly. But for example, on a text box, I could trigger a double click. When you went to that text box and double clicked it, I could write a reams of program about what happened when you double click that text box. Okay, right now we're gonna keep it very simple. I've got a button, one little button, one little click on that button, and this is what happened. Okay, I start off with this uh, little bit of soapbox right there, well-written form doesn't let the, does not, is gonna check everything it can check. Now, I'm not gonna do that right at first because I want to pass the, the, the back end some errors. I want this form to be, to, to let errors through at first because I want to see how well am I handling them. So I'm gonna get it. But ideally it would be this if logic, notice it's just plain old, oh, by the way, this is a different if syntax. I warned you that there were two kinds of syntax, syntax syntaxes um, for if, remember that? So one of them says if condition begin, yada, 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 end, else begin, yada, 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 end. The other way says if condition, Yada, 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 yada. Maybe it's got an else and maybe it doesn't. Else, yada, 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 yada. And if, okay? Two different ways of approaching it. Visual Basic is one way. TSQL is the other. Oh, well. So this one uses the end if. Other methods of, so if some error on the form, then this is the L label output. That's the name of my output label, LBL output. Dot text gets whatever I want to send. Did I put single quotes? I put single quotes, double quotes. That's my favorite error. Single quotes, double quotes, okay. Okay, so the first piece is the connection string. Here is the connection string. Um, local host means your computer. If you were running this on a remote computer, which you probably would not be, uh, or you might be uh, your web server and your SQL server are probably two different machines. So probably that would be an IP address a static IP address of the, the, the SQL server. I don't like my SQL server be on the same machine as my web server, why not? This is a case of the vulnerability. Yeah, web servers, web server has to answer the door. Web servers where the public's coming in. He's gonna be under attack all the time. He has to respond on port 80. I don't want my, my uh, I don't want that because that's gonna get taken over. That's gonna get knocked over. I don't want anything on there that they can use to uh, harm me. Now, they will get, if they do take over, they will get the user ID and the password for the uh, public user. I just have to assume that that's gonna be compromised which is why we took great pains to limit the damage that that user can do. He can play rock, paper, scissors, that's it. Um, which might be damaging. This has a, this is how you do a um, multi-line string. You put it, you use an underscore. Um, there has to be at least one space between the underscore. It's kind of picky about it. Um, but I just, I didn't want to run it all. There's, not, there's no harm and it runs off the page. It doesn't hurt anything. Um, okay, next, so this is the connection string. This is just a plain old string. The, um, if your user is named public user and whatever your password is, you put your password in here. This is a vulnerability because the password is in the string. The password is in the form. I don't like that. For right now, we'll live with it. So whose password is that? Is that the public, user? public user's password. Mm -hmm. 
and the public user cannot uh, do anything except execute the procedures. Public user cannot see the, the tables, does not know anything about what the table names are, how it's done underneath. Right. Is that a role or is that a user? Uh, question is, is public a role or a user? The answer is yes, public is a role. And I could, um, I could grant uh, the, the, the role, I, I could grant to public. For example, I could grant to the role. So I could say grant, execute on, insert RPS player to public instead of public user, they say to public. Now, anybody who has a login to that uh, machine can execute that. Okay. I could also create a role called RPS player and grant execute to RPS player. And now I can grant that role to other people. We are, we're gonna talk more about that one. Okay, next thing is I create the connection. So dim means declare, declare my SQL connection as, what is it, an SQL connection? Well, what, 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 what's an, where's, an, where's that? It's up here in this SQL client, it, it, it's defined here. So right here, if I did not have this import done correctly, I'm gonna get a big red error right here. Um, because so an SQL connection is defined up there. Uh, some of you have taken Java or C Sharp or C++ new. Have you ever seen new before? Something new for you. Okay, new means new is a reserved word. Um, it is called a constructor. Um, there's lots of things that have to happen before this SQL connection is ready. Uh, it's commonly found in files and stuff like that that is very tedious. Uh, probably 10 pages of code have to execute to get on that one thing when I say new. So I have to allocate memory. I have to set up buffers and all kinds of things for that connection. Uh, when, uh, when you say new, that causes a new one to come into existence. Before, all I had was, well, this, uh, this, this thing right here, my SQL connection, when I say uh, declare my SQL connection, that's really a memory address. It's a null memory address. And when I say new, memory becomes associated with that, and now it's the address of where this thing is in memory, which means it is a pointer. Um, which opens up a whole bucket of worms where I, I don't want to go right now. Okay, so I'm just trying to give you enough of what's going on here. So when I say new, I'm saying create one of these things. And it's, there's a lot of code that fires when you see new. So when you say create one of these things, is that That's the new. Object? It, this is an object. We're in object oriented. We're in an object oriented environment now. Over in TSQL, we were in a iterative environment. What is the difference between an object oriented environment and an iterative environment? Classes and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Notice we got classes and stuff like that here. Yeah. Um, here's the way I explain it. <clears throat> Uh, if I were to give you uh, instructions on how to open the door at an iterative manner, I would say get up, uh, turn to your left 90 degrees, take two steps forward, turn left 90 degrees, walk to the door, extend your hand, grasping this thing that looks like a doorknob. Now I have to tell you what that was. Turn it, push on the door, go out the door. Don't forget to close it behind you. Um, so I give you a series of steps. 
in an object-oriented programming environment, the way you open that door, your interface to that door is a property of the door. So all doors have to have an open method. It might be a doorknob, it might be a crash bar, uh, I don't know, it might be a button lock, a, a, a lever. There has to be a way to open that door. If you can't open it, I'm not going to let you call it a door. Um, might need a key. Uh, the way you open that door differs from door to door, but it's always a door dot open. So the way you open the door is an obvious property of the door. It's not something you do to the door. So the code by which you open the door is built in to the door. That's object-oriented programming, if that makes any sense. Well, let's go on with it. Okay, I've only gotten to two commands here. There's the first one, create the connection. So now I have a connection after that. And notice I passed it in the connection string. Actually, I'm done with the connection string now. I could have just copied that connection string inside of those parentheses, but it wouldn't have been as pretty. I like pretty code. Okay. An SQL command. An SQL command gets a new SQL command. I suspect that this one probably isn't as um, demanding as the SQL connection. I have to set up some things about the SQL command. The first three things are static, what I call static members that I have to set. I have to tell it what connection is it going to be using. Well, wait a minute, I just created a connection. Right back up there on line 34, I created a connection. So my mysql.connection, there's the door dot doorknob thing. The, the way you make the connection, dot connection, it's part of the SQL connection. What is it? It's MySQL connection. What's that? That's that thing that we just made up there with the connect string. Okay. SQL command dot command type. What is it? A stored procedure. Note that these are also objects. Anytime you see that dot notation, you're looking at an object. Um, my SQL command dot command text. Okay, what's this going to do when you get to the insert game? Here's the first place you change. When you're inserting a game, that's going to change. What? It's going to be your game procedure. Now I've got to set up my parameter list. These are the parameters that I'm passing to this guy. Uh, and this is the way we do it. <clears throat> okay, all, I, all I'm gonna do is look at one of them here. Um, add with value is the method. So this just gets copied. What changes is this is the parameter name over in the SQL server. The parameter name is at the underscore ID. And that has to be the name that the procedure is expecting. Where does that value come from? TXT underscore PID dot TXT. I everlastingly forget to put dot TXT. Do you? You've programmed in this language? No. Or something like it? We use a little bit of visual basic to work, but not. Oh, that's pretty easy. <laughs> okay. Well, I always forget to put dot txt, dot t-e-x-t. Um, in Oracle, by the way, it's called dot txt, <laughs> which uh, there's just enough difference to really drive me nuts. It's like teaching uh, Java and C++ back to back. Walk out of a C++ and into Java, it drives me nuts. Um, okay, and the others are done the same way. The other input parameters are done the same way. This just associates the, the input parameter name with the control on the form where it's coming from. And it's usually a text box. If it's not a text box, you're getting a little weird. I don't know. Maybe you like being weird. Uh, next two lines demonstrate the syntax of how to do the output parameter. Basically, if your output parameter is the same across your, um, <clears throat> for, uh, your procedures, this doesn't need to change. 
So the only thing that's really going to change here is this string and the parameters will change to reflect the name of the parameter and the name of the control they're coming from. So there's four lines that are going to change. Questions? Goodness. If you don't have a password, or we just put the host, the local host. Um, there, there is a way um, that if you work on it, you can figure it out. You have to program it <clears throat> where when you do the connection, you can pop open a uh, window and have your user put in the password right there. You have to have a password. I mean, uh, uh, the SQL Server is going to make you have a password. Uh, it's just a matter of what you do with it. Now, you could have it someplace. You could have it in a in a text box on the form where you entered it, and then as soon as you enter it, you could make it disappear, so you can't see it. But uh, you, you're going to have to figure out a way to get the password in. I'm just typing it in. I'm keeping this one. But this, Kiss. this password is, is not the same password that's on your form, right? No, that's a database. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is this is the this is the user's password to the database. Yeah. yeah. Good good question. So this password is different from on the form over here. Um I have password. That's not this password. That's just a password I'm putting in because um, I, I thought we might use it later. I don't know whether we're ever going to use it or not. Maybe we won't. Um, gives, it just gives us something else to keep track of. Um, maybe I'll make you put in the past. Maybe you'll, maybe you'll use it. Maybe you won't. Um, OK. Uh, command, so we set up the. Set up the parameters, set up the output parameters. Notice that the SQL, MySQL command dot parameters is the same. This one says add with value, and this one just says add. When it's an output parameter, I give it the name, and I give it the type, the type. So this is the SQL DB type. Tiny int is that um, Visual Basic doesn't know what tiny int is. It's SQL type. So this would be where you'd put varchar, varchar, or varchar 16. Um, if, you, if you use a varchar as an output parameter, it's, you just put it in as plain varchar, comma, 16. Okay, you can Google that and, and, um, and find a lot of that stuff. Um, then I have to give it the direction and the direction is output so here i have to say it's output so it takes me two lines to do an output parameter and then after i run it i have to go get it okay sql connection is expensive once i make that connection i want to get out of it get it closed as fast as i possibly can um consume memory and other resources. Uh, files are the same way. Uh, you'll see programmers that will open a file at the beginning of their program and, leave, and then process, process, process. They've, they're done reading the file and they just leave it sitting there and then the file, the program finally ends and the file's still open. Well, it closes it, but that's just really, really sloppy. Okay, I'm fussy about get that connection closed as soon as you are done with it. Use it till you're done and then close it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this um, try catch block is a little bit different. Well, the only difference is that I have to declare the exception that I'm going to catch. So I know that the, uh, that the SQL throws an SQL exception. Praise Google. What does an SQL, what, what uh, exceptions are thrown by an SQL connection? Google that and you'll find that it's an SQL exception. And where is it? Well, it's, oh, it's up here. It's defined up here in 
system data about SQL client. So I just, I declared EX as SQL exception, try. I have three things. My exception is gonna happen right there in the open. Probably, if I'm gonna have an exception, I'm probably gonna get it on line 64. Okay. Um, everything, everything happens, all of that stuff was just, so we'd have line 65. My, MySQL command dot execute. Execute non-query because if I just uh, execute a query, it would be like a select from where. I can also do that. Um, so if my if my text up here, command type or an SQL query, then this would be select player name from players where such and such and such, and I could execute it and get the return. Um, close. Else, I tell the user that your wheels fell off. Exit the subroutine. And, and try. So the try catch works exactly the same way as it did, except I have to specify the, the name of the exception I'm catching. Uh, lots of languages are like that. Uh, C++ has a very rich um, catch. Okay. Uh, byte and VB is tiny int and SQL, so I did FV form variable error level, form variable error level, and then go in there and get the return value. That's how I get in set line 74. I'm getting the return value into my form. I'm done. My logic is finished. I've opened the command, executed the command, opened the connection, execute the command, close the connection, get my return value. It's zero through five. We're done. Whatever's happened has happened. And I have a variable there that tells me what happened. Now what you do with that variable is your own business. Um, I'll show you what I did. Um, at this point, I would like to see some divergence. Now it's okay, it's okay if you use that connection, my, my code is a template, right? So you can uh, change your password, please don't use my password. Um, but it's okay if on the, on the dimensioning there's the connection, so you to get the connection, the command. So the connection string, the command, SQL, com S connection string, SQL connection, and SQL command. Um, if you just modify mine, it'll be fine. Uh, from this point, um, I wanna see your own code. Okay, I'll show you mine. I think mine's cool. We'll find out. Uh, let's take a short break. Okay, we're back from break. Um, one of the properties of SQL and SQL programming and TSQL or PLSQL is we don't really care what it looks like. We don't care about the, about the output. It's just an output of zero or one or two or three is fine. Uh, because we don't, the human being is not running that code. Now we're, we have a human being at the console. So we're gonna start worrying now about giving output. Now I call output, good output, I call crisp. Crisp, it's good output if it accomplishes what it's supposed to do. You know, I've got a hamster that's cute. I don't need cute computers, okay? And, um, so don't, I, I don't care a whole lot for chatty output, chatty friendly computers. Uh, um, it's just, just a, a sentence, uh, it should be a complete sentence. It should have a subject, a verb, a period, and all that stuff. So it should be a, uh, it should sound like a sentence that was written by an intelligent person 
grammatically correct, but it, you don't have to write a whole book here. Okay, yeah, just enough of the of it for. Okay, here's how everything that happened. Everything has happened, so all the logic is complete. I have a number back that tells me what happened up there. So I've tried to insert it. Something happened. That number came back and told me what happened. Now I'm going to translate that number into providing good feedback to the human user. And by good feedback, I mean I tell them what happened. Um, declare error messages. What is this? It's an array of strings. Okay. This always get, this gives me trouble in Visual Basic. Arrays. Uh, okay, in C, an array. Uh, and if you dimension an array of five things, what do you get? You get zero, one, two, three, four. Zero, one, two, three, four. But you really get five because you count zero. Okay, when you dimension an array of five in Visual Basic, it starts at zero and it goes one, two, three, four, five. You get six. Okay. Uh, I wish they'd do it like everybody, but it's Microsoft, you know. Um, I can handle it. So I get, uh, I dimension an array of five, but I get zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. But, oh well. Had you dimension an array of five in C, you would have gotten exactly five, but it would start at zero and only gone up through four. So I don't know which one's better. Um, people who like Visual Basic doesn't give them much trouble. Um, here is where I get the echo print in there. Okay. I'm putting it into the array, position zero. I go over there and I get the, te the uh, text out of the PID. It just comes off the form. Um, was inserted successfully at zero. And uh, then the next three are um, just failed because of what? Something's null. And then uh, um, another one, I wish it wouldn't do that. Another one where I echo print, the name's already in use. And finally, error message five. <clears throat> error message five comes back. That, that's the one it hit, it hit a trigger. So go contact tech support and read the log to find out what happened. Uh, the log should give me better information there. And so given that I have this set up, this array set up, I think this is cute. Label output.txt gets error messages. There's the array. Index into the array using the output of the... Now, can you do it other ways? Yeah. Could you use if logic? Yeah. Um, do you know what a case statement is? Google is your friend. I, um, when I'm thinking in terms of doing something like that, I don't typically reach for a case statement, also known as a switch statement. Um, I don't use them much. People have tools that they like. Um, I will tend to go one way with it and other people will go a different way. We both get to the same place. We both, uh, using a case switch is not any less um, efficient than if, if you use it correctly. Um, Right. If the error level comes back, if I if uh, if the error level came back a three, right, it would come back right here. So that's where it's sitting there waiting for me in the input buffer. And so I take it and I put it into this. Now I could just take this and put it down here. I don't. I I 
I'm not a big fan of doing too much composing of stuff, particularly when I'm trying to teach it. Uh, later, I might do that, but when I'm trying to learn it or teach it, I'm trying to, I try to break it down into as many as simple steps as I can. So right here, I get the, I ha here's the error level, that's zero, one, two, three, four, five. And then let's say it's a three. So output text would get this. So that five is what originally was our 99. Right, um, I changed it to a five. Now you can go back and change that stuff if if you, it it worked better if I had and what I'm going to do what I, what I see it doing I I, meant, I don't know whether I'll write any more code or not I would just keep the five as the and I just have unassigned you know four could just be unassigned if I only had zero one two three and I just didn't have another error message I just put four unassigned make it be null oh. Anyway, but basically I want to get a, a good, based on that return value, I want to get good feedback for the user. So now we're talking about giving, giving the user good feedback. I don't know that uh i don't know that i will have the error level that error this error level in the errata table because that means i got through the procedure um i don't call the i don't pass the error level to the input uh to the insert so the trigger if the trigger fired it's not going to hit the it, it, it won't see that error level if the trigger fires that error level is going to get if the trigger kicks it out and throws an error that error level is going to come back a five so if you get a five here that means a trigger fired and stopped it or it could be a table constraint table constraint would also throw an error Now, one other thing I wanted to consider here. Um, so anyway, I, this is one way to do it. Don't copy my code here. Um, I, I, want, I want you to develop your own. Go ahead. I already designed the database and the thing you need the sentence, the message, how can I put it in the message file? It's coming from your database? Yeah, example, is it coming as an output parameter? So an output parameter, uh, uh, you're giving it back a string as an output parameter. In that case, when you set up your parameter here, it will look like this. So how, how big, uh, yes. I don't know why it's, uh, what, do, what am I doing here when I select, it's going into a wait loop. Okay. Yeah, oops. Oh, I forgot. I can't do that here. You, there is no, um, you just have to do each line. Uh, the other thing it tries to do is format, and it's real hard to get it to stop that. Okay, uh, this is going to be, uh, this is your error message. I'm going to call it MSG. Okay, what's its SQL data type? Is Varchar, I expect. Varchar maximum. Yeah. Varchar, and then the next is a comma, and how big is your Varchar? Maximum. Maximum, I can't see that constant. What, uh, what's the size of your Varchar? What is maximum of... Uh, It, yeah, that's going to be, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's from database, right? Yeah, that's, uh, I wouldn't use that because that's way, way too big. You could write a book in there. Um, set it to something reasonable like, 
that should be enough. 64 might be better. So you have to put the 64 in there like that. And then this message. So that's what it would look like to get that back. So now when, when you got it back here, you would, um, when you get it here, dimension your, your error message as, um, as string. And then you do the same thing. So this would just be as string and error message. And I think you can figure it out. It's uh, you can get it. You can get it. If it's coming back from that procedure, you can you can uh, send it back to your uh, form. Okay. Now, one other thing I wanted to talk about here is, um, and I didn't um, implement this right away. Um, notice that I wipe out the PID. Wipe out the uh, take, I, so I wipe all that stuff out of the form. In other words, gets quote quote. So once you press it, once you press the do it button, that's all gone. Okay. Button insert player enabled. <coughs> False. <coughs> Okay, now, what's that gonna do? When you press the button, let's, let's, watch, let's watch how he runs, how he runs, debug. Okay, tiny, Tim. When I press the insert player, Notice that it went away. <clears throat> it is disabled. It's a one-time game. I only play one game because it disables. Okay. Nothing. There's nothing I can do. I can. I can put things in there all day long. Nothing. You know. I don't have any way to to send them over. So I'm stuck. Like Chuck. Name by name, Chuck here. Um, okay, let's look at these other subroutines here. Um, this is commented out for a reason. Actually, I think there's a way that I have of just doing them all at once. Highlight, highlight it, and then what is it? Um, the what now? Tools. And. Well, on the second level, it's there displayed on the toolbar. So if you exit the tools. Exit the tools. Look at, so keep going to your right. Right, keep going. Right there. No, no, no. Those two. Comment out. Okay, so if I click uncomment. Okay, so if I click that, that'll uncomment. Okay. Um, anyway, now these guys are going to run. <clears throat> Let's look at what they do. So what is this? This is a method of the text PID. Text PID. Leave. Now, there's a couple of them that I could trigger there one of them is leave there's there's two um when the mouse enters is an event when the mouse leaves is an event now sometimes when the mouse enters that is called got focus they're not exactly the same thing because usually i have to go there to the text box and click it before it gets focus so got focus and lost focus mouse enter mouse leave and there is another one I can trigger called text changed, right? So when I change the text, but then I'm gonna trigger that every time I type a letter, 
okay? So what this is gonna do, this is gonna trigger when the mouse leaves or when the focus leaves the text box. So I come to the text box and I type S-A-M, Sam, and then I press enter or I click in a different text box or I click someplace else. I've left that text box, that's an event. What am I gonna do? Okay, uh, this is the PID. First, I'm gonna trim it. Remove spaces. Then, if text PID does not equal nothing, text P name does not equal nothing, in other words, the empty string, and uh, text the P name, and text password does not equal string, then button insert player dot enabled gets true. Enable it. Else, it's false. Now let's uh, compile this and run it. By the way, they're all the same. Uh, so P name is Lee dot, uh, underscore leave, P name dot leave. P name dot text, trim it, remove spaces if there are any spaces on the ends. And then these are all exactly the same. Check all three boxes. Make sure that all of them have something in them. If they do, enable the button. <clears throat> If they don't, if there's one of them that doesn't, disable the button. Is nothing like the properties on those text boxes to disallow? There may be. Yeah. Um, it's not the, I'm, I'm looking at the property of the text box and I'm disallowing the button based on the property of the text box. So I don't see any way I can do that uh, except with an if statement. Right. Um, maybe I could not allow, what would, what would I do if, um, <clears throat> how would I tell you that it wasn't allowed to have nothing in that text box? Validation, yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Absolutely, and that's validation, a absolutely. That's what you Google to figure out how to do that, and if you want to use validation, then use validation. That's what we're, what? You could pop up a message box. Um, you could have a snake crawling out of a skull and a, and a, and a flash form. This is where you can get creative, yes. Now, I'm getting a little creative here. Um, in mine, Start without debugging. Notice that he is um, huh. weird. Well, what? Uh, okay. Okay. Um, this one? <clears throat> no, actually, I was going to start with. Um, I was going to. I was going to start it with the button insert being disabled to start. I don't think that that would have caused that behavior, though. That was strange. It, it was working a minute ago. Where is it? Enable. Enable, true. So I start with the button <clears throat> as disabled. So now he starts he starts in disabled mode. Now he should have enabled there. Um So something is not uh, when he leaves 
trimming <clears throat> if <clears throat> Somewhere here, I've got some invalid logic. Well, there's nothing wrong with that logic. It's pretty simple, really. That one of 80, 80 or whatever is not probably complex? I don't think so. Uh, we're never getting there. <clears throat> Uh, I don't get there until I press the button. So the button has to enable and then I press the button and the button submits the stuff from the text box and after it submits it, it disables itself. That's kind of a toggle. So the, the, these guys are supposed to, maybe I just, maybe I just need to build. Now I'll try it. Well, that should have enabled it. Something isn't working. Okay, well, I'll get back to you on it. Um, I'll make it work before I get out of here. Um, <clears throat> meanwhile, I'm going to go ahead and dismiss for tonight. Um, I don't have a clue why that's not working. It was working before I, oh, what's this? No. So I wanted to disable there on line 92. Um, I mean, the problem with it is, is that when I come out of that text box, when I leave that text box, <clears throat> PID leave, P name leave, PWD leave, when I leave that text box, I want to check to see if all the rest of the text boxes are filled in. <clears throat> and it was working perfectly. So if I go back to another text box and I take the value out of there, when I leave, then it disables the button <clears throat> because now it's probably something silly I'm forgetting to check. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end the recording now. So that means I'm gonna go ahead and come out of the, um, I'm gonna end the meeting. Good night all.